Everybody, welcome. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I know you've got a lot of choices, a lot of places you could be right now, so thanks for coming here instead. Uh, we have very little time and so much to cover, so let's get straight to it. Uh, I believe that code is, if you're among the uh, people connected to the internet, of the four billion or so people on the planet Earth connected to the internet, I believe that code is the single most powerful thing you can do to affect change. So I always start with code. Please grab that for your own reference and edification for later on. Uh, now, a little bit about me. My name is Josh Long. I'm the Spring Developer Advocate. I've, uh, uh, you know, I'm very happy to be back at uh, DevOps Poland. This is my, uh, one of my many times visiting here. I love this conference very much. I'm also online. If you have questions uh, beyond our little bit of time together here today, our 50 minutes, please don't hesitate to reach out to me to send me uh, questions on, on Twitter or email. How many, how many of you have Twitter? Twitter? Anybody? Okay. Some. Good. What about email? Email. <laughs> email. Anybody? So get on Twitter. Twitter is a new IRC. It's good stuff. Um, I'm also a book author. So my latest and greatest book is called Cl Cloud Native Java. That's uh, all about this one, this uh, same st sort of stuff we're going to talk about today. I'm also an open source contributor and engineer. I'm the number one top ranked, seven years running, number one contributor of bugs, but still number one. More bugs per commit than any other contributor for all the projects, like Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, Spring Integration, Vaadin, Time Leap Activity, etc. Seven years in a row. Uh, and lastly, I work at Pivotal. Now at Pivotal, we have lots of great open source software, but make no mistake, that is not the reason we're here. It's not the reason we're excited in the morning. You see, at Pivotal, we help, we help customers and community members and organizations move quickly from concept to production. We care very much about this movement. We care very much about seeing uh, work moved from idea to production. And that's very important, is to go fast through that loop, to have an idea, to innovate, to, to, make, you know, to develop it, to test it, and then deploy it. And we see that a lot of organizations struggle with this. They want to go fast, but they can't. They know that speed is the secret sauce. They know that it's a differentiator. We don't need to look too far for evidence of this. For example, Netflix and Uber and Airbnb and so on are all organizations that when they started didn't have better resources or more money or more intelligent people or anything like that. They just had the advantage of speed. Speed is a differentiator. So we see these organizations struggle with this, and they know that uh, that they need to be able to go fast to be able to compete with these existing, uh, you know, new startups, these new companies that are able to go fast, that have agility. And so they ask themselves, how can we go faster? And they, they realize that small is better, less is more. They realize that if they move a small batch of work through their pr value chain, from product management to, to user experience, to the developers, to the testers, to the administrators, etc., that they're going to be able to go faster. And so they look for small batches of work. And of course, this leads them to the question, how do I define a small batch of work? And they can turn, of course, to Dr. Eric Evans and his amazing book, Domain Driven Design, and in which he talks about the idea of a bounded context. A bounded context is a part of the domain model that, when extracted from the larger whole, stands internally consistent and reusable unto itself. Uh, a bounded context is a natural candidate for extraction. You can extract these little bounded contexts and have a small group of people focus on delivering that bounded context. We call this a, a feature team, or an autonomous team, or a, um, a two pizza box team, to borrow J Amazon's Jeff Bezos terminology. This is a team of uh, co-located developers, product management, user experience, etc., all focused on delivering one thing, not divided into roles, but divided into deliverables, right? The service, the feature, the bounded context itself. This small batch of work is ideal because now you don't, have a, you don't have a large group of people. You have a small group of people focusing on one thing, and so there's not, they don't have to have long meetings to talk about what they're going to do. They can just do it. This is great because now you have a small batch of work that you can deploy without waiting for the rest of the organization. You can deploy it and evolve it without waiting for changes in other parts of the group. Uh, you have a, stand, a singly focused, internally consistent, reusable, independently deployable batch of work. This is a microservice. A microservice is a unit of organizational agility. And so when you move to this architecture, what you're really doing is you're hacking or optimizing for Conway's law, which says that you know, software serves, the or rather software reflects the organizational structure that it serves. So if you understand this, then you know that you have two pains to, to address before you can move to this architecture. The first is how do you stand up a service quickly and consistently? And this is a big problem. I think most organizations have the dreaded nightmarish wiki page uh, in their organization, 500 easy steps to production, right? That wiki page is the enemy of velocity. 
It's all the stuff you have to do before you can stand up a new service that is production worthy. For that, I would definitely recommend taking a look at cloud computing technologies like Cloud Foundry, and of course, frameworks uh, or service chassis like Spring Boot, which make it dead simple to build production worthy ser services thanks to auto configuration. The second pain that you're going to have is now you've invited new complexity into architecture. You've got a distributed system. These are components separated by network partitions. That's how you get the independent deployability. And when you do that, you invite distributed systems complexity. And if there's anything upon which I'm sure we can all agree, it's that building distributed systems is hard. And so that's what we're going to talk about today is the patterns and pains you need to be able to understand and work with to be able to, to address those distributed systems complexities. Uh, and we're going to look at something called Spring Cloud. Now, I'm going to go ahead and build a very, very simple service uh, here at start.spring.io. So this is my second favorite place on the internet after production. So you know I love production. I care about production. To me, production is the happiest place on Earth. It's better than Disneyland, right? But if you're not already in production, then you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io. If your children are restless and they can't sleep, start.spring. If you suffer from indigestion, seek relief. Start. That spring. That I owe. And if you suffer from, if you want for inspiration in the early morning hours, start. That spring. That I owe. What we're going to do is we're going to build a very, very simple service. I don't care about the service so much as I just I want to have something that we can play with and we can work on. So I'll, I'll bring in Spring's web support. I'll bring in H2. Uh, which is an embedded in-memory SQL database that, because it's embedded and it's in, in memory, it loses its state after every restart. So in this way, it's very similar to MongoDB. Uh, we're going to bring in the config client. Uh, we'll bring in Eureka service registration and discovery. We'll bring in RabbitMQ for stream processing. We're going to bring in REST repository support. We're going to bring in JPA, because I make poor life decisions, so JPA. Uh, we're going to bring in, uh, do I need anything else? Config, Eureka, Stream, Rabbit, um, Zipkin for distributed tracing. And that, I think, will do. We'll hit Go. And I'll be given a zip file. And that zip file is just a project. And I'm going to go ahead and very quickly build an application. So I'm assuming you have some Spring Boot familiarity. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build a simple domain model. Uh, and I'm not going to worry too much about the domain and the nature of the application. What I want is a REST API. So I'm going to build a domain model that uses this REST, REST, REST API. Uh, and the domain is going to be a reservation. Right, a very, very simple type. So I'll say class reservation. Okay. And I'll annotate this with at entity. And I'll give it a primary key like so. Reservation name. And we'll annotate this with at ID, at generate value. Now, we're covering Spring Cloud, so a lot of this stuff is uh, hopefully already familiar. But we're going to talk about a, a lot of things that are new as well this time. So hold on tight. We have to go faster today than last time. Right? This is for JPA, and specifically JPA. And I always forget, and things go wrong. So there's that. And then we have another constructor. And then finally, we're going to create a repository. Now, repository is a, a repository is an object that handles the boring, soul annihilating, uh, you know, unnecessary reading, writing, persistence logic uh, within length persistence here. And this is, again, from Dr. Eric Evans's domain-driven design. I want this to be a REST repository, so I'll annotate it as such. And I'm going to create some sample data. So I'll say implements command line runner. OK, and then I'll override the run method. And I'm here, I'm going to insert some records into the database. So my name is Josh. It's nice to meet you. Uh, um, my buddy Rob is in the audience, so that's cool. Who else can we add? We can add the good Dr. Dave, add uh, Phil. There we are. Um, Jennifer, Jeremy. OK, that's, uh, what is that? That's six. We need a few more, Mark and Mark 2, OK? For each one, for each name, we're going to save a record in the database using a very, very cool feature. Oh, nuts, this won't work. I should uh, create this as a bean. At component, public static class CLR, implements command line runner. Whatever you do, keep it simple, OK? So, Private final reservation repository. What? Hello. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use constructor injection. This is the correct way to do it. Uh, this is the only way to do it. If you do it any other way, things will be sad and unhappy. So don't ever do that. One awful way to do it is to use field injection. Don't ever do that. 
Every single time you do this, a unit test dies, every time. So never do that. Um, we're going to tell Spring to inject it, and then for each record, I'm going to say, let's save a record in the database by creating a reservation like that. Then I'll uh, print out the records using another feature unique to very modern languages like Java, Smalltalk, COBOL, Lisp, Perl, PHP, etc., called the method reference. Okay, and there we are. There's my very simple type, and I'm just going to run the application. If everything goes well, we should see that there's a REST API with eight records in the database uh, that we can now talk to. And um, a good thing, too, because we're running out of time. Let's see. Whoa. Nobody likes you, iTunes. So, localhost 8080 forward slash reservations. There we are. There's my REST API. You can see that I've got uh, the payloads. And because I used Spring Data REST to annotate this repository, it automatically created an API that has hypermedia. This is an envelope object. This blue box on the screen there, that's a, blue, that's a, that's a resource object. It's called a resource in a technology called Spring Hot OS. Right? Hypermedia is the engine of application state. Hypermedia promotes self-describing REST APIs. Because remember, very few developers write documentation, and none of them read it. Right? So what we want is a humane way to talk to different services. These links give you clues about what you can do given a, a current payload. Um, what we need to remember is that this resource object has the payload and a collection of links. So we'll, we'll see that again later on. Now, let's talk about customization. If you know Spring Boot, then you know that I, I can change things like the port by going to application.properties inside of my uh, source main resources directory. Uh, and this is certainly very valuable, but it means I have to recompile the code each time I want to change that variable. So an alternative instead is to, uh, is to use let me add a two-string there. An alternative to instead is to use 12-factor uh, style configuration. So I say here, downloads, reservation service, and I'm going to make this. I'm going to say maven minus d, skip test, because YOLO, right? Clean install. <coughs> and then CD target. And I have a so-called fat jar, or a, you know, a Josh jar. And um, we're going to say Java minus jar, and I can run this application like that, right? And that's, very, that's a, a fat jar. That's, it has everything we need to be able to deploy this application. And my dear sainted grandmother, who is otherwise very intelligent but not particularly tech capable, she can run this because she has applets on her computer. And so I always wonder if operations teams have trouble with this. I tell them to talk to my grandmother. Now, this is one way to run the application, but you can override configuration. You can use dash d arguments, for example, to say Java minus jar reservation service dot jar. And uh, you can see that here, localhost 8,000 uh, reservations. Come on, computer. Uh, it's trying to call services that aren't, on the, aren't running yet. So there we are. So now it's on port 8,000, and that worked. I can also use environment variables. So I can say, oops, export, no, oh, export server underscore port equals 8010, Java minus jar reservation service dot jar. Well, let me just show you this. This will turn into an environment variable. Uh, turn it will get normalized into the default property, and we'll see that reflected here on the console, so 8010. This is very good, but it's going to fall short for several different use cases. Suppose I want to centralize my configuration, or suppose I want to have my configuration reloadable at runtime, live. What if I want to keep my information um, in one place, and I don't want to have to copy and paste it from one place to another? What if I have secure information, sensitive information, like passwords? And then also, uh, how do I do auditing and journaling? How do I see who changed anything, and then, if necessary, to roll that change back? So for all these reasons and more, while what I showed you is a good start, we can do better. We should do better. So I'm going to bring in a config server, which is a Spring Cloud API that manages a directory full of configuration. And we're going to go ahead and build this service very, very quickly, but we're going to manage a directory full of configuration based on Git, which you can get from my GitHub as well. It doesn't really matter where the configuration lives as long as it's managed by Git. So your local file system on GitHub, GitLab, whatever, it's all the same thing, right? So here it is on my local machine. Who's sorrenting? OK, good. Um, so config service application, at enable config server. I'm going to go to application.properties. I'm going to say to Spring Cloud that it's going to manage or um, it's going to manage or babysit a set of configuration, a directory full of configuration on my home directory on my desktop in the config folder. And you can see that directory here, right? Desktop config. And it's just a bunch of property files. And these property files are each containing you know, uh, keys and values that different microservices will want. So if we start this up, it will spin up on port 8888. Now, what configuration 
would, for example, a microservice called the reservation service C. So if I have a microservice called reservation service, I want to get my configuration for that service from the config server. The config server is going to be my central proxy, my, reverse, my, my doorman. It's going to be the mediator, the, uh, the guardian of my different configuration files. So let's see. If I go to localhost 8888, reservation hyphen service, forward slash default, this is the config server. This is not my reservation service. This is one I just created. And you can see there are two property files, reservation service.properties and application.properties. All microservices, no matter what their name, will see these keys and values in this property file because it's generic. It's a fallback. Only the reservation service will see this configuration. Specifically, it will see hello world, and it will see that the port should be port 8000. These sets of configuration here and here get merged. So the more specific value here overrides the default fallback value, value there. Now, let's go ahead and change our reservation service to draw its configuration from there. And we, we can do this because we have the Spring Cloud Starter Config client on the class path, right? So if everything goes well, all we need to do is just tell Spring Cloud, uh, first of all, what the name of the service is. We're going to give it a name, reservation-service. And we'll uh, tell it where the config server is right here. Okay. And then we need to rename this property file to bootstrap.properties by convention. So bootstrap.properties. Now, once that's up and running, we should see this application start on port 8000. And what I want to do is I want to create a simple REST controller that uh, emits or manages, the, um, manages the, the message key that we have in the config server. So I'll clean my poor code from earlier. Okay. And we'll, um, we'll say, at REST controller, Class message rest controller. Okay, and we're going to say private final string value. Create a constructor at auto wire the constructor value, and we'll say at value curly bracket curly bracket message. And we're going to say request mapping method equals get equals value, or sorry, message even. And all we're going to try and do is to show the message that we've injected from the config server. I'm just demonstrating that we're able to su successfully inject that value. But I may want to change this value later on. So I'm going to make my, my bean refreshable so that I can change the configuration live while the service is running. I'll also take some tea because I have a super sore throat. Oh. OK, local host, 8,000. Reservations. There's that, right? So we know it's working on port 8000. And there's the message as well. The message is good, but it's not great. So let's go back to our config server. Sorry. CD desktop config, Joe reservation service dot properties. And we'll change this message to be hello, DevOx, PL, extra exclamation mark, so as to reinforce my authority and credentials on Reddit. And then we'll say git commit minus A minus M, YOLO. OK. Uh, now, my microservice, my config server, sees the new value immediately. But my microservice has no idea what has happened. We need to tell it to reconfigure itself, to refresh itself. And we can do this very simply. We can say curl minus D, HTTP localhost 8000 forward slash refresh. So what I'm doing is I'm triggering a actuator, actuator endpoint. And actuator is a set of endpoints that are contributed to Spring Boot apps if you want, it, if you want them. Uh, like, for example, the metrics endpoint. Metrics shows me how much memory I've got, the heap, the non-heap, the code classes, et cetera. Right? Or ENV, or the health endpoint. These are endpoints that are good for observation and visibility and operational ability. Right? So now I've got my message endpoint. I'm going to trigger another actuator endpoint to trigger a refresh of this value. So here's the value down here, and refresh. Okay? So I hit curl. It made an, an empty post. As soon as I was able to, as fast as I could, I went back to the, the browser, and I hit refreshed. That one object was recreated in situ, and so the value was visible immediately. So that's cool. That's very, very powerful. It gives us feature flags. It gives us the ability to decouple the release of software from the actual deployment of that software. That gives us the ability to support dark launches. This, in turn, also lends itself to branch by abstraction, which, if you're doing continuous delivery, uh, is very, very useful. Because in continuous delivery, you want to have constant integration into master, uh, and so this helps that. The next thing we need to do. Um, I'm sorry, you want to have constant integration into master, but you don't want to have work on branches. So 
if you have something that's in a branch for more than eight hours, the, the trick is to keep it in the code base and then hide it from the actual production system. So you use a, a Boolean or a flag to turn it on or off. Branch by abstraction is what it's called, and feature flags give you that. The next thing we need to do is to talk about how these things talk to each other. And there's a few ways to do it. We, we could use DNS, but DNS is a, a bad fit in a cloud environment. So what we want is actually a service registry, something that we can use to connect our different services, sort of like a phone book for the cloud. You see, DNS, for all of its power, um, needs to be cached, first of all. It's a very dumb protocol. It doesn't know how to answer the question, for example, uh, if, I ha if I make this request, will anybody respond? And DNS also works with load balancers, and these load balancers are often very, very dumb, unsophisticated things. They can do common things like round-robin load balancing, but they, um, they don't have the ability to handle more specific, more nuanced kind of load balancing. Like, for example, suppose I have an OAuth token, and I want to route that request uh, you know, from the client to a specific node. Right? Some load balancers will have stateful or si sticky or session affinity, uh, but again, they don't know about non-standard things like, a, like an OAuth token. And um, so what we want is the same effect of DNS without the extra pain. So we're going to use a service registry, and a service registry is a very powerful thing. It's a, a phone book for the cloud. There are many different options that we can use that Spring Cloud supports, like Zookeeper and uh, Console and, and uh, Netflix's Eureka. I'm going to use Eureka because it's very, very simple. It's been uh, used at scale by one of the biggest websites on the planet. It's bulletproof, and it was easy to set up. Right? So I have actually Eureka service right here. And if that goes well, that'll be on 8761. Oh. Oh, there we are. So a couple things to notice about this. Very, very important. First of all, good quality animated GIFs. <laughs> we have people for that. And then, and then no registered instances. So we need to change our reservation service and teach it to raise its hand to say, listen, if anybody needs me, this is my host, this is my port. So we're going to bring in the Spring Cloud Discovery Client Abstraction implementation for Eureka. So we have this one here, Spring Cloud Starter Eureka. And the only thing we need to do to be able to, what's wrong with you now? Huh? Something is wrong, but it doesn't tell me what. I'm confused. Do you see what error I just typed in, friends? Hmm? Come on, Maven. Not now. Oh, of course it was. How eclipsing of you. So what we need to do is to teach it to talk to the registry by saying at enable discovery client. And, uh, and that's it. Once we do that, it'll raise its hand, it'll, it'll tell the registry where it is, and then other services can consume that service via the registry. And now, because it's available via the registry, these services don't even have to be routable via DNS. They can be just host and ports. Who cares? They can be dark or you know, in, invisible. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to build a client to talk to our service. We're going to call this the reservation client. And the reservation client is going to have the config client, Eureka service version, discovery support, rest repository, Rest repository support, web support, Histrix circuit breaker, Zool, micro proxy, RevMQ stream processing, Zipkin for distributed tracing, uh, and that's, that's probably enough. It's probably enough. So we'll go ahead and bring that in. And what we're going to do is we're going to build a couple of different kinds of clients, specific kinds of clients called an edge service. Now, an edge service is a component that lives at the logical architecture edge of your application, of your system. Uh, it's going to respond to requests from outside. For example, from your iPhones and your iPads and your, uh, uh, your, your HTML5 browsers and whatever. Right? So you can centralize these client-specific concerns here in the Edge service. Think about HTML5. Right? HTML5 is very, very powerful today. You don't have to hold its hand. You can do amazing things in the browser. Here, for example, is a JavaScript application that loads an ISO and then boots Linux entirely in the browser. So tell me again why you needed to build that JavaFX app because I just booted Linux entirely in JavaScript. Don't tell me you need more power than that, right? So the, the point is, you can do amazing things in the browser today. Um, but in the browser, you do live in a sandbox, and that sandbox has limitations. You can't make requests to different services outside the same origin 
it's very much like coffee, right? It's got a single origin policy. So what we need to do is we want to proxy the requests from the Edge service, from the HTML5 clients, through a proxy, and then have those call different services in the registry. And for that, we're going to use Zool. This is the micro proxy from Netflix. I don't know how much of you have been keeping abreast of your Greek and Ghostbusters mythology, but this is Zool. Zool is the gatekeeper to hell. Dum dum dum. Or at least that's what I thought. But you know what? I'm not actually sure. And then my friend said, you know, Josh, that's not fair. We can't judge. He may come from a nice place like Hawaii. It's not fair to judge. So I don't know. Whatever. He comes from somewhere. He's the gatekeeper. Okay? So Zool is a gatekeeper to our other services. And Spring Cloud, along with Zool, automatically sets up routes that we can use based on the service IDs in the registry. So we say service reservation hyphen service forward slash reservations, right? So that's the service ID in the registry, and then that's the actual path. Here's the edge service. Here's the actual service. Okay? Actual service, edge service. Actual service, edge service. Actual edge, actual edge, actual. Oops. No. Actual edge. Actual edge. Okay? So notice that the Edge service is sending a request to the downstream reservation service, which it looks up in the registry, and it's sending a header, and the downstream service is rewriting its URLs to reflect the header that's in the, in the request. So the, from the perspective of the client, it has no idea that this service, this output wasn't generated on that node, right? So there's no reason it has to know. Uh, and the benefit, of course, is I can now talk to any services I want, right, very easily. I can talk to all of my services that are registered in the registry. The question, of course, is, how does it pick which nodes to make the request to? It uses a service ID, and then it makes a request to the registry, gets all of the server instances, and then it passes that collection of server instances to a, collection, a component called Ribbon. Ribbon is a client-side load balancer, and that client-side load balancer does the enterprise distributed systems microservices equivalent of eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Right? It picks an instance from that collection. And that happens all inside the, uh, on the client. So you can change that strategy. It's just an object. It's an algorithm. It's a heuristic that you can plug in. So this is one kind of edge service. It's called a microproxy. Another, of course, is just to create an um, API gateway. So we're going to build a very simple API gateway. We'll say reservation API gateway REST controller. And we'll say private final reservation repository. Or sorry, private final REST template. And what we want to do is we want to create an endpoint that responds to changes in the system. Or sorry, we want to create an endpoint that responds to requests and just returns the names. So we don't want to return all the data. We just want to return just the names from the, uh, the downstream reservation service. So I'm going to say that this endpoint will be mapped to reservations. And it's going to use the REST template, and the REST template here is going to be used to make a, a quick REST call to the downstream service. But my, I want to take advantage of that same client-side load balancing that I have here. So I want to do the same thing in the REST template. So I'm going to configure a load balanced REST template like so. Right. There we are. And my load balanced REST template will do the right thing automatically when I call requests, when I make requests with service IDs in the URL, so reservations, for example. So this is the service ID. This is not DNS. And it's going to automatically get load balanced. Okay, And I'm going to say that I want to get a collection of resources back. Remember what we saw earlier. This is a resource object. This is an envelope object. It has a payload and has a collection of links. And so we want to take that JSON and turn it back into the Spring HotOS or HateOS uh, resource envelope object like this. right? So there we go. So new parameterized type reference. And we're going to use the type token hack, I'm sorry, design pattern, to uh, tell Spring's REST, uh, REST template what kind of data we want back. In order to do this, in order to understand what we're doing, uh, we need to consider Java's type system, right? Java's bro broken type system. So list of string x equals new array list. What is t in this case, right? What is the generic parameter in this instance variable? Right? It's a, uh, it, first it'll be, at first we might think it's string at one time, but if you ask it via reflection at one time what it is, all right. Uh, if you ask it what, it what it is at runtime, it'll, um, 
tell you that it doesn't know. It doesn't have a generic instance. So you can get around this by using subclassing. You can say new array list of string like this, and then subclass it. And now, if you use reflection, t equals string. That's because I created an anonymous subclass right there. Right? It's the same as if, same as, as, as if I had done uh, x extends array list of string, etc. And then I use that, right? So a new x. So if we understand that, then we know what we need to do. We need to use subtyping to capture this generic information in our uh, parameterized type reference, which is very, very convenient. It's an abstract type, but I need to, first of all, have an object to cast it to. I'm going to take the JSON and map it back to my reservation type, but I don't have the JPA type from the service itself on the class path, so I'll create a local representation here. Okay. Good. Resources of reservation. And notice that if I fail to have this, it fails to compile. So I need that uh, in order for this to work. Now, <clears throat> once I've done that, I can pass this in here, and I will get back a status code or the body or the headers. I want the body. I want to get the content, which is the collection of reservations. I want to stream over the reservations and then map from R to R of reservation name and then collect them all into a list like this. Of course, this can be a, a method reference as well. So this is going to work just fine in the 80% case, but it's going to fail in the 1% case. It's going to work fine if there are zero or more instances of the service in the registry. But we need to understand that failure will happen in a sufficiently distributed system. It's inevitable, like death and taxes. Right? So instead of assuming that we're always going to have one or more instances of that service available, let's re make sure that we have a fallback experience so that if there are zero instances, it's going to gracefully degrade. High-performing organizations do this kind of thing all the time. They say, oh, well, uh, you went to the search engine service, but it's not available. So here's a uh, set of machine-learned recommendations. In order to do that, we're going to introduce a uh, circuit breaker like this. A circuit breaker is a component that when there's a risk of too much traffic, opens the circuit and stops the conduction of that traffic through the circuit. It, it, in a building, for example, when you have a circuit breaker, it stops the risk of overwhelming amounts of electricity. So we're going to say return new array list of string, right? Or we're going to call this fallback. There we are. And that's going to be what this method is going to call. So if there's an exception in this body, if this should fail to load balance, if anything goes wrong, it's going to throw an exception. The fallback method will be called, and we'll get an empty array list. Uh, this is a stateful component, though, so we'll eventually see it uh, recover. It, like if we if we uh, restart it, if we restart the actual service, and then uh, the circuit breaker is there, it'll try to reintroduce traffic eventually. So let's go ahead and see this working. First of all, localhost um, 9999 reservation names. There's my simple API gateway that's working in the happy path. But we also added a circuit breaker, right? So we know that if we go to the reservation service here uh, and then kill it, that it's going to stutter. It's going to hesitate. It's going to try and make the request, but it can't. It's going to eventually time out. I can force it to open the circuit by hitting Command R really quickly. And then there we go. And now it goes straight to the fallback method. And it's not even trying to call the downstream service. It sees that enough exceptions have happened, and so it's going straight to the fallback. This gives our downstream service time to recover. We need to care about resilience in a sufficiently distributed system. And so, finally, we're going to look at observability. Now, there, you know, I've uh, shown you how to do introduce resilience in a system here using a read. And of course, in a write, you want to prefer eventual consistency, right? So you might use Spring Cloud Stream, for example, for messaging, so that when you write a message, uh, to the downstream service, it can be delivered via message queue. And if that downstream service isn't available, then at least you'll have buffered the message in the message queue. Uh, but you know, on a close, on a closing note here, let's talk about observability. My system right now is uh, very, very simple, but I want to be able to see what the system. Is, I want to be able to see what the different services are doing, um, and I, I have the actuator to help give me node by node uh, and host by host information, but I don't have the ability to see. Uh, what the whole system is doing. There's emergent behavior in a system. Remember, the map is not the terrain. The, what you see on the map is not what you're actually experiencing when you walk through a city, for example. And so we need to understand and capture that emergent behavior. This circuit breaker represents the connective tissue 
uh, between a client and a service. And in particular, it's a great thing to have when you're calling a third-party service that is uh, not uh, reliable, right? If you don't have the ability to instrument or govern or manage that third-party service, a circuit breaker is a great thing to have. Uh, so we want to be able to capture and understand and observe that, that traffic through the circuit breaker easily, right? So I restarted, by the, I restarted the reservation service, and there we are, right? Now, let's go ahead and build a dashboard to monitor the Histrix circuit breaker. Hit config client, we can discovery, Histrix dashboard, we'll generate, open this up. Histrix dashboard application, at enable, Histrix dashboard, at enable discovery client, open up application properties, spring cloud, config.uri equals HTTP localhost, 8888 spring, that application name equals Histrix dashboard. Bootstrap.properties. And now this is going to expect a service end event heartbeat stream, or heartbeat stream that gives us information about the flow and the state of that individual service. Now every, ser every service that has a circuit breaker will produce the stream on that node. And of course, if you have multiple services, you can take all of the streams from multiple services and create one stream out of them using Spring Cloud Turbine, right? Uh, but in our case, we've only got one instance and one service, so we'll leave it at that now. I can get the stream here, 9999histrix.stream. Histrix.stream is never ending. There's always new data. It's always being updated. There's always new results. It's infinite and endless, like the oceans and the bugs in my code. So whatever you do, Whatever you do, do not curl this endpoint, okay? So, so now we're going to open this dashboard that we just created here and paste that stream here. I'm going to say monitor the stream, and I'll be given this little dashboard, localhost, 9999 reservation name. So I'm going to make some requests on the left, and you can see the moving average on the right is trending upward. We're seeing new results very quickly, and so on. So this is fine. Everything's happy. Now, Right now, the circuit is closed. There's no need to open it because services are working. There's no errors, 0% errors, and so everything's fine. Now, let's go kill the reservation service one more time. I make a request, and you can see the request is hesitating. 100% of the requests are failing, and the moving average is now stopped. Now, the circuit is open. It's going directly to the fallback method. So this, the circuit breaker dashboard is very, very useful if you're using dashboards, uh, if you're using circuit breakers, rather. The other way to get visibility into the whole system is to use distributed tracing. Now, distributed tracing in theory is very simple. All you need to do is to take every message that enters or exits the system, add a unique header to them, and then make sure to propagate that header. Zool, microproxy, or whatever, right? All these different places where messages enter or leave the system via the REST template, for example. Any of that code, as long as there's a filter, an interceptor there, to add the right header, then you're in good shape. Uh, that's in theory, right? In theory. Uh, but it's a lot of work. And so we do a lot of that work for you, thanks to something called Spring Cloud Sleuth. Let me find it. Sleuth. Sleuth is a, the English word for, like, detective, you know, to search for clues. And so you can see that here. You can see that automatically Spring Cloud Sleuth is logging the client ID, or the service ID, rather, the trace, and the span. A trace in the, in the Spring Cloud Sleuth discovery client, you know, in the Spring Cloud Sleuth distributed tracing abstraction is the whole journey of a request from A to Z. A span is each request in the journey from A to B, B to C, C to D, etc. And so this is already being done for us, and this is being logged on the console. This is useful, but it's not enough, right? I mean, I, I can dump these logs into a tool like Elasticsearch or Splunk or Paper Trail. And if I have something like Cloud Foundry, that's dead simple to do. But I still, uh, I still have to you know, go through my logs and mine that, those logs to find this information. So I'm a big believer that uh, a picture is worth a 1,000 spans. right? So we're going to use uh, the Zipkin distributed tracing platform from Twitter. You see, we have people on the Spring Cloud team uh, who are from Twitter and from Netflix who can contribute to it. So we've got some very cool stuff here. We're going to go ahead and hit build up a Zipkin service itself. 
And this is going to be very much like everything else. Okay. So we'll say at enable discovery client at enable zipkin server and go. And this is going to sit there on the side receiving traces from our services. Okay. Localhost uh, 9411. And we can see that the, dis the distributed tracing server sees our services because of the, reg the registry. We've already integrated it for us. And I can now do traces. Let's, let's create some traffic. So there's some requ requests that are flowing from the client to the service. And now we go back to our distributed tracing server. And we say hit find trace. Uh, sorry. Uh, there we are. So there's some traces that were recorded in the, last, in the last minute, of course. And if I click on this, you can see that, for example, I had one request that took 21 milliseconds, and the message started at the reservation service, and then it left the res oh, sorry, res it started at the reservation client, then it left the reservation client, and then it arrived at the reservation service. This string here is the to address. It's where it's going, right? So it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily on the same node. It's, it's wherever this is moving to. So in this case, it arrived to the reservation client or at the reservation client going to this, this endpoint. It left the reservation client going to HTTP reservations, which is on the reservation service, which it got to 17 milliseconds later on. Right? So now if I click on these different waterfall graph nodes, I can see the information about the request itself. I can see when the message arrived, when it left. I can see tags that I can use to understand uh, and correlate transactions to requests, right? So this is very, very powerful. It gives me the ability to understand latency, and it gives me the ability to answer questions about the state of the system right now. There's also this very cool little, you know, topology graph it shows me that this client depends on this service, and there's been 17 calls and, and so on. Now, mind you, this information is not supposed to be warehoused. You're not going to use Everything either. You don't have to trace everything. Twitter, for example, who created this technology, uh, they trace something like one out of every six million requests. They don't need to see every request to be able to see a pattern. Okay. Well, we've got six minutes. Do you want me to try and do OAuth? Sorry? I mean, it's going to be very fast, but, you know. Up until now, we've been going very slow because my voice is hurting. Let's try it. So the final thing I want to talk about is securing our reservation client. So remember, our reservation client is an edge service. It's, a, it's taking requests from outside, and those requests need to be authenticated. So what we're going to do is we're going to build an authorization server like this. I'm going to use OAuth2 support in Spring Cloud Security, the config client, JPA H2. Um, REST repository support. Why don't we, we don't need REST repository support. We web support. Um, Eureka service registration discovery and config client support. There we go. And I'm going to open this up. I'm going to build an OAuth authorization server that's going to provide tokens. And remember, in OAuth, you have, an you have the notion of an identity. And the identity is actually two things. It's the user, Josh, and his client, the iPhone or the HTML5 or Android or whatever. There are multiple versions of OAuth, multiple flows, and you probably have already seen some of them. So first, before we move on, I need to make sure I use Spring Security dot version 4.1.0.
So in the sign in with Facebook flow, it redirects you to facebook.com and then asks you, do you want to approve of this third party service accessing your information so that it can spam your friends, your family, and your loved ones mercilessly and endlessly until they hate you, right? And then you say, yeah, go for it, absolutely. Spam them all. They deserve it, right? That's, the one, that's one version of OAuth. Uh, but that doesn't make a lot of sense if you're just, if you're building your own client for your own service. If you are Facebook, do you think Facebook.app on the iPhone should redirect to Facebook.com asking if you give Facebook permission to access your Facebook? That makes no sense, right? In this case, it's fine to just send a username and password and get back a token. And that token has information about your identity and what your permissions are. So you have to, hand, you have to answer both questions. So that's what we're going to do. We have to build a simple account type here in JPA. It's going to have, uh, oh boy, we're going to run out of time here. I'm going to say private long ID at ID at generated value. I'm just going to insert some sample data in the database here. So I want to have a, a quick object to do that with. So username, password, and I'll create a Boolean called is active. And I'll create uh, some getters. Whoops. Another constructors. More constructors just for JPA. All right. Some two string methods. And we need to save records of this in the database. So I'm going to create a repository as before. Account repository extends JPA repository. And I need to be able to answer the question, given a username, what is the account that that belongs to? So find by username string username. OK. Here we are. And I need to create some sample data. So I'll say component class CLR implements command line runner. And I'll implement this. Private final reservation repository. Oops, sorry, I don't have that. Private final, um, do I need anything? Yeah, I need the re account repository. Private final account repository. Two minutes, gee whiz. OK, here we are. I'm going to say stream.of, my name is Ja, oh no, we want J Long Spring Desire Cloud P Web Boot, All right? Names, just names. So I'm going to say I'm going to say let's map each string to uh, we're going to split it, and then we're going to for each one of those we're going to visit that record and save a record in the database using the account repository. So save new account, and we have to we have to give it a username. So the tuple zero is the username, tuple one will be the password, and then the final thing is is it active? And we're just going to say yes for everybody because everybody gets an account, everybody's active. Look under your seats, everybody. All of you are winners, OK? Um, so we're going to save a record, and that should give us three records. Now, we have to answer a few basic questions for Spring Security. For example, Spring Security needs to know about our user details, and we're going to create a user details service implementation using our JPA stuff. So this is a very simple contract in Spring Security. It says, whenever somebody asks you, given a username, give me the user details. Now, user details is a very, very simple type. It has basic things like the username, the password, and then is it active, and then a collection of strings. These are strings that map to scopes, roles, permissions, whatever. So we're going to say that we want to use private final account repository. And we're going to create a constructor here, naturally. And we're going to say return this dot account repository dot find by username, passing in the username. And we're going to map it from an account to a new user object, which is a user details implementation, right? So there's the user object. I'm going to say either, uh, we're going to say give us the username, give us the password, account that is active, and I'm going to just copy and paste that four times because that's basically all I need. And then we're going to return a uh, collection of uh, authorities, authorities that correspond to arbitrary strings. So I'm going to say that this is the, every is a user uh, and every is an admin, right? So there we are. Um, otherwise, if that, doesn't, if that user doesn't exist, the contract says we need to throw a new username not found exception. So we'll say username not found. Shh. It's telling me I'm out of time, but I don't believe in such things. So there we go. So now it's what we've got a user detail service. And the, um, what we need to do is we need to tell Spring Cloud Security and Spring uh, Security OAuth about our client. So we're going to say at enable authorization server at configuration. 
We'll say class OAuth config extends authorization server configure adapter, naturally. And we're going to override two methods here, clients and endpoints. And these endpoints are just callbacks so we can override and change things. So the first thing I need to do is to um, pass in the authentication manager, which we're going to inject in our configuration class here. So authentication manager. OK, we'll say this dot authentication manager. There's this. And the second thing we need to do is to uh, set up the clients themselves. So I'm going to say I'm going to have an iPhone device or an HTML5 device or whatever. In my case, it's going to be a static list. So I'll say with client Acme scopes equals open ID authorized grant types equals password. I don't want to do the multi-legged dance. I just want one type. And um, uh, which other one? Oh, secret, right? So I'll say Acme secret. And that is how you tell Spring Security and Spring Security OAuth about your users. <coughs> this is how you tell about the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is about the clients. This is about the users. The final thing we need to do is we need to set up an, a token exchange endpoint so that whenever somebody wants to take a token and trans transfer it in, term, you know, in terms of a, of a token and get an actual hydrated Java security user, we're going to actually build an endpoint that they can do that with here. So principle, and this is a bit strange to look at. What it's going to say is whenever somebody makes a, a git, actually, I don't even need git. I can just do user principle, inject the principle. So when somebody makes a request, we're just going to, if it's authenticated, we'll just give them the principle right back. And we need that for the other services. And that's a bit of a, bit of a weird thing to look at, but uh, we'll talk about it later. OK, so that should do it. That should be everything we need to be able to set up a security, uh, you know, an OAuth authorization server. Let's start it up. Come on, computer. And we can prove it works by going to my Postman browser plugin here. Or not. Postman, come on. Okay. What are you doing? Josh demos, get the token. So we're going to send a request to 9191, which is where my auth server is running. At least it should be. Yep. And I've prefixed every request in the auth server to Fortress UAA. So Spring Security provides this part, and I've just managed to prefix it with that. Okay. So we hit send, and it gives us a valid token. So we know that's working. So now we have to write a very little bit of code to protect our reservation client to make sure that requests that go to the client, get dis they get rejected if they're not valid. Uh, so we're going to use this. We're going to say spring cloud starter OAuth 2. And then we have to do this, this hard bit of work. At enable resource. Come on. There. Now I'll restart my client. So what the client is going to do is it's going to go to the config server. I'm sorry, it's going to go, what the hell? <laughs> Local host. Um, it's going to go to 8888 auth service. It's going to get its configuration default. And it's going to see that in order to get a valid um, token, it needs to translate that token by going to the auth service here. So it sees that URL here, security OAuth2 resource user info equals UA user. That's the endpoint we just set up. So if everything works now, we should be able to send a request using this token. We just created, let's create a new token. Okay, grab that. And now I should be able to on the command line, very simply, curl minus D, I'm sorry, curl minus H authorization um, bearer paste HTTP localhost. 9999 forward slash reservations forward slash names. And that works. Now let's prove it doesn't work by, let's prove it the negative by uh, removing some of the token, making it invalid. Now it says invalid token. So there you go, my friends. We've very, very so, ever so briefly looked at just some of the stuff in Spring Cloud, and we did that with me having no voice at all. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take questions. I'm sorry we ran so long. <laughs> <sighs>